Charlotte. The war has turned. General Cornwallis took flight with his army and moved north. We continued to engage the British, and in the months that followed, Cornwallis entrenched himself at Yorktown, Virginia. George Washington escaped from the north undetected and surrounded Cornwallis, who could not retreat to the seas. It was blocked off by our long-lost friends, who had finally arrived. Vive la France! Vive la liberté! I beseech you, you must order the surrender. How could it come to this? An army of rabble, peasants. Everything will change. Everything has changed. Though he eventually surrendered. And that was the original Brexit. Yeah. Get it? Get it? Get out of here. No. Uh, everybody knows that story. I mean, that's, that's why we celebrate this weekend. And it's easy to lose sight of that, isn't it? That, um, you know, all the festivities and we have a lot of fun and, uh, you know, fireworks and whatnot. But it's all about America's war of independence with Britain. And, and everything was on the line at that time. And you saw the, the, Fran the French were coming in by, by sea and uh, we were surrounding them by water. And, and there's that moment of surrender uh, and, and it was all about having a new identity, right? We all know our, our American history, uh, about uh, having a new identity separated from England and from the crown and the monarchy and all that jazz to become our own people with our own way of governing, our own way of believing as religious people, our own way of, of doing life as Americans. And so it developed. And it's interesting because much like the War of Independence that we celebrate on July 4th weekend, the Israelites, the Israelites had to fight violent nations to survive. That's a part of the story of the Bible. They had to fight violent nations to survive, to possess what God promised them, to possess God's promised land, God's promised covenant, their new identity. And it was on the line. In fact, it, it, the book of Joshua depicts this. I don't, I don't recommend that many people read the book of Joshua without having some some real instruction behind it because it's really easy to read the book of Joshua and just go, there it is, there's God, it's all about war and destruction without having context and perspective on it. But you all know the classic story of this and this is Joshua who is taking the mantle from Moses and he is he's forging into the promised land. But there are a lot of violent cultures that he has to encounter, one of which is in Jericho. And the famous story we all know is you know, Jericho, where they march around the city and the walls fall down and they siege the city. Let me read this for you. Uh, this is a place of real violence, and it's depicted in this Joshua chapter 6, verse 5 verses. It goes like this. Now, the gates of Jericho were securely barred against the Israelites because of the Israelites. No one went out and no one came in. Then the Lord said to Joshua, see, I have delivered Jericho into your hands along with its king and its fighting men. March around the city once with all the armed men. Do this for six days. Have seven priests carry trumpets of ram's horns in front of the ark, the ark of the covenant. On the seventh day, march around the city seven times with the priests blowing the trumpets. When you hear the sound, a long blast on the trumpets, have the whole army give a loud shout. Then the wall of the city will collapse on the army. The army will go up and everyone will go straight in and take the place. It's a violent deal. This is a, this is a, a war scene that's being depicted. This is like, you know, Private Ryan of the ancient world. The walls fall down. Why? Why was, why was Joshua, why were the Israelites doing this? Because God's promise, God's identity, God's future was being threatened. And sometimes when life as God intended it, this is a general statement. When life as God intended is threatened, we sometimes have to confront the threat. Now, that's not an advocacy of violence or war whatsoever, but sometimes in different ways, we have to confront that which threatens God's dream, God's identity for life as we know it, individually and in God's world. We were, we were out yesterday. Some of you were there uh, at the big rally at the beach, and um, thousands of people showed up. Why? 
Why? Because of how the identity of Stewart, Florida is being threatened. Is that a fair statement? Um, the, the, the waters are being polluted. You can't fish, you can't swim, you can't surf. I mean, that's a, that's a picture. That's a picture. Actually, that boat on the right is Ed's boat, our neighbor, Ed's boat, uh, right over here in Manatee Pocket. And um, it's absolutely horrible, our way of life, but really it's about the identity of why people move here in the first place, right? Being threatened. And so there's a confrontation, peacefully, obviously, about our identity as South Floridians. And uh, the identity of Stuart Florida is being threatened now as God intended it to be. God didn't intend for manatee. A manatee died yesterday, washed up. It's just crazy. It's just crazy. So it's a way of understanding a little bit what's going on with Joshua and how it, how it impacts us, how it shapes us. God's covenant with Joshua was all about preserving the identity of God's people and God's promise. It was really being threatened. We are in the middle of this series called Promises, 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 God's Faithful Covenant. It's a way of understanding the impact, the meaning for us of God's promise making and, and, and what it means for us. We have looked at this, and I have a chart that I'll just sort of throw up and show you again. Hopefully this is helpful. I apologize, it's hand, hand drawn. But this is a wonderful way of depicting just sort of the whole story of the Bible. Not only the story of the Bible, the story of life. What God has done, is doing, and where God is going with the future. God created everything beautiful. That's the covenant of creation. We know the story in the first two chapters of the Bible. Everything's perfect. Listen, there were no manatees dying. There was no algae in the water. It was beautiful. All creation lived in harmony. There, were no, there was no pain. There was no death. There was no suffering. I mean, there was no violence, no crime. And then sin came into the world. And that's where the, the dotted line comes down. And God, ever since then, is on a mission to get us back to the pattern of creation, the covenant pattern of perfection, of bliss, of beauty, of God's glory, of living in that. We call that heaven. So Jesus ultimately takes us back to that, restores us through this covenant of redemption. But God, just as you heard Diane Strickland, who's speaking at the Global Leadership Summit, say, for whatever reason, I don't understand it, God takes his sweet time. He works through individuals and communities, different times and different places. And so you see that depicted through the different covenants he makes with Noah and the covenant of hope represented by the rainbow, with Abraham and, and his covenant blessing, blessing the nations and it, it being the father of the nations. With Moses, we talked about covenant life and how God draws us together for meaning and purpose together. Today we talk about Joshua and preserving our identity when it's threatened as individuals and Corporately, we'll be talking about uh, David next week as the embodiment of all of this and as a foreshadowing of Jesus, who is the Messiah who brings it all together. The covenant of God. It's hard to believe when you look at that. And we talked about this last week. Between Abraham and Moses, that's 400 years. That's 400 years. God, we don't even have Noah dated. We don't know how the dating of that. That literally represents thousands of of years. God takes his time. And so it's hard to believe after 400 years in slavery, after, you know, giving this promise to Abraham of a child and all these things, it gets to Joshua and it could have all fallen apart right there. It was sort of hanging by a string. After centuries of struggle, it could have ended there with Joshua. And so what does Joshua do? He throws down a gauntlet and he says, you've got to decide. You've got to decide your identity. He's talking to the Israelites. You've got, presumably, they've been walking around with a rabbit's foot in their back pocket. In case God doesn't work out for us, in case this deal, this covenant with God is not really all, I've got, got a backup plan in my back pocket. Listen to the way this is uh, implicated in Joshua chapter 24. He says, this is Joshua speaking to the Israelites. Now fear the Lord and serve him with all faithfulness. Throw away the gods your ancestors worshipped before beyond the Euphrates River and in Egypt and serve the Lord. So they, they're, they're sort of still hanging on to these idols, you know, just in case, a little insurance policy. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods of your ancestors served beyond the Euphrates or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. And then this is where he draws the line in the sand. But as for me and my house, we 
will serve the Lord. A lot of people have that as a placard, you know, on their front door uh, as a way of kind of identifying their faith. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Joshua, Joshua is there in this place called Shechem, and he's making a covenant. And he's saying, you want to be a part of this? It's your choice, Israel. You want to be a part of this with me and my family? Because it could all end right here if you don't. And this is the way it's depicted. The people will say, yeah, yeah, we do. We're on board. We've come this far. We're going to throw away our idol, idols, and we're going to choose once again and make covenant with you and God. And here's the way it's depicted in verses 24 and 26 through 26. And the people said to Joshua, we will serve the Lord our God and obey him. On that day, Joshua made a covenant for the people. And there at Shechem, and remember that word Shechem, it's a city. It's a really special place. We'll explore that. He reaffirmed for them decrees, the decrees and laws. And Joshua recorded these things in the book of the law of God. Then he took a large stone and set it up there under the oak near the holy place of the Lord. Remember we talked about how whenever God makes covenant, whenever God makes promises, then and now, there's always associated with a sign. There's a sign that's associated with it. And so here he is. He's setting up a stone as a marker in this holy place called Shechem. You see, Joshua is pushing the envelope with them, and he's saying, listen, I'm choosing, once again, to go forward with God's plan for life, our life and for all life. What's your choice going to be? Choosing God's covenant identity is about choosing God's way over your way. It's that simple. And, and we have to make that choice again and again and again. They did. Choosing God's covenant identity is about choosing God's plan over your plan, God's future over your future. And that's no small deal because we like to be in control of our future. We like to have our own plan. We like to be our own God. And it's a little bit like keeping that little rabbit's foot in our back pocket. Just in case your plan doesn't work out, God, I'm, I think I, I, I kind of know how I want it to end, how I want this to go. Our future, our plan, our control, our way tend, however, to lead away from God's plan, God's blessing, God's redemption, God's hope. Now, all of this, all of what's going on here is represented, all right, see if you can, you can grasp this, in what's called theological geography. That is to say, where something happens in the Bible is as symbolic and significant as what is going on. And so they're in this place called Shechem, Shechem. And we have a map of Shechem. It's, it's up there at the top. And there's, you can't see it on this map, but there is a ridge running down through those cities. Shechem was in the, in the middle of Israel. And uh, Joshua named Shechem, and we're going to keep this up here. Uh, he, he named Shechem a city of refuge. It was a place of amnesty. You, you ever seen the show, uh, what's Dog the Bounty Hunter? There were bounty hunters that were after people. It was sort of like the Wild West back then. And Joshua said, this is going to be a place where you can receive amnesty. If you're being hunted down for whatever reason, guilty or not, this is a place where you can receive peace. So Shechem, Shechem becomes a city of refuge. In other words, it represented God's peace. God's peace. That's Shechem. Shechem was also a part of this ridge route, a lot like uh, the Appalachian Trail. Anybody ever hiked the Appalachian Trail? It goes from Georgia to Maine, and it's a ridge. And uh, you can kind of just stay on it and go all the way up or down, whichever way you start. And, and so it's a 50-mile route that goes through all of these holy cities that are very symbolic of God. You know, we know a lot of these cities, Bethel and Jerusalem and Bethlehem and so on. Very, very significant. And so as what's called the ridge route, it represents God's places, God, holy places. Not only was it a city of refuge and a ridge route, God's peace, God's places, but it was also called, this route was called the way of the patriarchs, the way of the patriarchs. Because Abraham, who started this whole gig way, way before Joshua, he explained God's covenant in, of all places, Shechem. He built an altar there. Jacob built an altar there and then dug a well. Remember Jesus and the woman at the well in the story in the New Testament? That well is still there today. I went to Israel in 2000, year 2000, and, and drank from that same well. It's in Shechem, this holy place. It's in the Old Testament and it's in the New Testament. Moses pronounced his covenant there. Joseph was buried there. Jeroboam was this king of the northern tribe of Israel and made it the capital city of the whole kingdom. 
This is a lot like the Hollywood walk of fame in the Bible. This is like, you know, all the stars of all the major players in the Old Testament are there in Shechem. Shechem represents something very important. It's the way of the patriarchs. In other words, it's the way of God's people. And so let's, let's go to the next slides that depict these three. It's a city of refuge. It's a place of God's peace. It's the ridge route. It's God's places. And it's the way of the patriarchs. It's God's people. You see what's going on here? The city, Shechem, is representing something amazing about their identity, their potential, God's plan, God's future. And so what Joshua is doing is this. Joshua is anchoring his identity and their identity in God's peace, in God's place, and in God's people. Now contrast that with Jericho. Why didn't he stop and do this in Jericho? They laid siege to Jericho. They took it over. Why not Jericho? Jericho represented violence. It represented godlessness. Jericho was, was used as the, it, Jesus used Jericho in the parable of the Good Samaritan. Remember what happened? A guy is beaten on the roadside, left for dead, and then this Good Samaritan comes along. Now, I'm going to show you a picture of the road to Jericho. That's Jericho. Jericho was a place where you could get ambushed and you could get donkey jacked. It'll come to you. It could get donkey jacked. Just laugh a little. Just humor me, guys. Instead of car jacked, donkey jacked. Um, it was a place of, of real violence. Uh, it was known as a place that was very, very dangerous. In fact, contrast that with being the way of the patriarchs or the ridge route or anything nice like that. It was actually called the robber's way or the way of blood. And so... It symbolizes something that's really the opposite of God's dream for the Israelites. And so Joshua steps back and he asks them, okay, guys, here we are. We've come this far. We've come this far. What's it going to be? What's your identity going to be? You got to choose again. What do you want? God's peace, God's people, God's places? Or you want to go back to Egypt with your gods? Or do you, want, do you want to go back to Jericho, the way of blood? You know, it's not such a great place. Which way do you choose? And the reason this is important is because what you choose, and the same is the case for you and me, what you and I choose will shape our identity. Where our loyalties are, who we identify with, shape our identity. That choice is ours. We let a thousand things shape our identity, don't we? We let so many different things shape and change our identity. And it's, it's absolutely unbelievable. Um, too many things rob us of God's real promise. I had a, a letter. I get, a, I get anonymous letters. And I actually had it. And this is what happens in the last service. Someone took up my notes for me and the letter's missing. But I'm going to tell you what was in the letter. It was an anonymous mom, and typically anonymous letters are not a good thing for me because it's usually cowardly. But this one was actually very, very um, humbling. A, a mom wrote a letter to me, and she said, my son, no names were, were in this letter. My son is, um, was recently arrested. He's an alcoholic, and he does crack cocaine. He was arrested for selling crack cocaine. And she said, Pastor, will you please pray for him? I don't have a name. Will you please pray for him, that God would heal him? that God would restore him. And, and so I, I do. I mean, if it's a letter from some of you, I want you to know I'm praying for him. I don't even know. God knows. And that's all I need to know. God knows. We can be robbed. Now, that's an extreme example, isn't it? And it's so easy for us to go to such an extreme example like that and to get ourselves off the hook. But the truth is there are a lot more subtle things that can rob us of God's identity for us. Let me give you one such example, technology. It absorbs our lives and it, it makes promises to us that really are not very, um, don't, they don't come true. There's an interesting research that was done by Dr. Sherry Turkle. Dr. Sherry Turkle wrote a book called Alone Together. She's an MIT professor, smart cookie. And she was actually on the cover of Wired magazine some years ago um, representing, you know, the greatness of the technological revolution. But she has since come to analyze the impact of technology on us and how it is distorting and destroying 
relationships and how we communicate thus alone together. And this is what she said. This is really fascinating. She said, technology seems to promise satisfaction of the three great human desires. Here are the three great human desires. That we will have attention everywhere, number one. Number two, that we will always be heard. And number three, that we'll never be alone. That we'll always have attention, that we'll always be heard, and that we'll never be alone. These are the promises that suck us in and take the place of truly getting attention, being heard, and not being alone. The promises that we know can only be filled by God. The psalmist knew this, and Psalm 139, it's my favorite psalm in all of the psalms, all 150 psalms. I want to share the first part of this. This is his recognizing how God fills this need, how God knows him in a way that no one else can. You have searched me and you know me. Now, let me stop right there. The word, the Hebrew word for know, the Hebrew word for know, how can I put this? It would be used for a sexual act of intimacy. You know me that intimately, God. I mean, all is laid bare before you. You know me that deeply. You have searched me and you know, know me. You know when I sit and when I rise, you perceive my thoughts from afar, you discern my going out, my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you, Lord, know it completely. God knows us better than we know ourselves. God knows us, in other words, the way we yearn to be known. The way we yearn to be known. Only God knows you like you need to be known. Timothy Keller comments on this. Timothy Keller is one of my favorite teacher, preachers, authors, and, um, and he, he comments about this. Listen to what he says. He says, to be loved but not known is comforting but superficial. To be known and not loved is our greatest fear. But to be fully known and truly loved is a lot like being loved by God. It is what we need more than anything. It liberates us from pretense. It humbles us out of our self-righteousness and fortifies us for any difficulty life can throw at us. Being known in this way by God and loved as we know God loves us does not remove difficulties. It does not make life easy, but it fortifies us for difficulties. Well put, Reverend Keller. When, you, when your identity is shaped by the God who loves you and who knows you like he does, and he still decides that he wants you, loves you, and likes you. You know what happens when you realize that? The moment you realize that, your whole view of yourself, of others, of the world, and of God is transformed, utterly transformed. When you realize God chooses you that way, God wants your identity to be based in that reality. And so the psalmist, the psalmist realized this, how God knows him, I mean, in, in all of his ugliness, God knows him that intimately and still loves him that deeply. Here's the result. Here's the end of the psalm, Psalm 139. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place. Even before he existed, God knew him. When I was woven together in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were in your book before one of them came to be. How precious to me are your thoughts, O God. How vast is the sum of them. Were I to count them, they would outnumber the grains of sand. When I awake, I am still with you. Listen, that needs to be our prayer. That's my prayer for myself and for you that we would know how loved we are, how known we are by God, and be able to respond with that kind of heart. Spiritual growth happens when you remove what blinds you to knowing what the psalmist knows. Spiritual growth happens when you remove what blinds you to seeing how God sees you, to knowing how God knows you. Let me illustrate this in a, in a way that might be helpful. This is a very, very cool thing that's used in a lot of workplace environments, a lot of organizational environments. It's something called the Johari window. 
Uh, and the Johari window is a very interesting depiction of what happens when you come into a room of people. All right, we're in a room of people, and I'm going to use myself as an example. There is, according to the Johari window, what is called the public self. Right now, I'm on display as the public self. This is the person that I know that is on display before you and that you see that is before you. This is the pastor on the, on the platform in front of you. This is the public self, all things. But there, there is a side that I don't, I don't know about myself that you might know about me. You see something about me that I don't see. I see something and know something about you that you don't see or know. That's the blind self. Now, the private self, are, those are the kinds of details in our private life that you want to kind of keep. Uh, you know, you have toe fungus. You don't need to publicize that, right? There are some things that you just want to keep as a private self. And the unknown self, that is the potential that you have to become someone new for your identity, your experience, for who you are to expand, to grow, to evolve. That only happens when we're given new opportunities, to explore something that we haven't yet explored. So here's what the social scientists say. You're at work, you're at home, you're in any social situation. You want the blind self, the blind self to be as small as possible. In other words, you want to see yourself as others see you as much as you possibly can. To not be blind to aspects of who you are, your identity. So your public self grows. You want the private self to be pretty small. Some things you want to keep there, right? And you want, the, you want the public self and the unknown self to be the two that expand. Let's apply this spiritually. When you see yourself as God sees you, you remove the blinders to who you truly are and to who you can become the unknown self. How do you do that? Only by digging into God's word. Only by putting yourself in front of the truths of who God says he is to you, for you, through you, in you. And so here's the truth. The key to spiritual growth is seeing yourself through God's eyes. It's that simple. The key to spiritual growth is seeing yourself through God's eyes. When you begin to see yourself through God's eyes, then you begin to see others through God's eyes. You begin to see creation. You begin to see God through God's eyes. And it expands from there. It's letting God shape your identity. So let me give you just a sampling here. And this is just a teaser, hopefully, of the way God sees you. Just some samples from the Bible. How does God see you? How does God shape you? What identity does God want for you? You go to the very first chapter in the very front of the Bible, Genesis chapter 1, verse 27. It says this. It says, let me get to it. God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. In other words, how does God see you? You are an image bearer of the holy God. Do you, do you realize what that means? That God chose you to be an image bearer of the holy God. He could have done anything. He could have chosen anyone, anyway. Psalm 139, once again, we, we read that. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Just sort of underscore that. Do you, do you realize what it would mean to live your life and all of life out of the center of understanding that God has made you wonderfully, out of joy? You are wonderfully made. God didn't just kind of go, mm, dang it, wish I hadn't done that. You're wonderfully made. But this is not all pie in the sky either. God knows that we have to live with our feet on this world, in this world. And so Jesus gives real practical wisdom about who we should be and how we should be in this world. I love Matthew chapter 10. Jesus speaking to the disciples, he says, I am sending you out like sheep among wolves. Therefore, therefore, be as shrewd as snakes and as innocent as doves. In other words, you know, where do we get this, this, this idea that we just need to be kind of vulnerable, innocent people? You know, you see Jesus with the lamb and all. No, no, no. He's saying, you have a brain. You need to be shrewd, but it's not just shrewdness, it's innocence put together. This is a part of who you are to be, how I'm shaping you to be. Ephesians chapter four. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. What would it look like if we had in all of our relationships this idea that we were to be humble and gentle and patient? How would it change our relationships? How would it change our community? How would it change our world? You know what it would look a lot like? Shechem. Shechem. A place of God's peace. A place of God's people. 
God's place. Ephesians 4.32, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as Christ God forgave you. Practice the grace of Jesus with others. That's who you're becoming. That's the unknown self that is expanding into the public self. Sharing that with others. Sharing forgiveness, compassion, and kindness. Lord knows we need more of that. And then in John 15, oh my goodness. This is amazing. The God of the universe puts on flesh. His name is Jesus. He comes down here and this is what he says in John 15. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you, everybody say it together, friends. God calls you his friend. We're made a friend of the living holy God whose image we bear, who calls us to a certain quality of relationships. You see what is going on here? He's shaping our identity as we draw close to understand what it's supposed to be. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, and I love this. Do you not know that your bodies are a temple of the Holy Spirit? No longer does God reside in the temple in Jerusalem. He chooses you to live in to put his power, his spirit in. You are that valuable. You are called a temple of the Holy Spirit. And then the last words Jesus speaks before he ascends to heaven is in Acts chapter one, verse eight. He says, you will receive power from the Holy Spirit when he comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. You will be my witnesses. God chooses you to be his spokesperson. Not me, us, each one of us. Not just through what we say, but what we decide, what we choose, how we live, who we are. So listen, this is the challenge I have for you and for me too. There's so much more. And I just want to challenge you to stop this week and put whatever those distractions are aside long enough to absorb the way God thinks of you. Stop long enough to know God and to grasp how God knows you. That's my challenge to you this week. Stop long enough to know God and to grasp how God knows you. The psalmist made it a command in Psalm 46. You remember that? Be still and know that I am God. You can't, in other words, know God and therefore know how God knows you unless you're still. And so it could be crack cocaine. It could be technology. It's whatever is crowding your calendar and crowding out your ability to know God and to be known by God. We simply need to be still long enough. Do you know how hard this is? We resist it at every level. A study was done with a group of men and women, and this was the question that they were asked. Would you rather be still with your thoughts or administer electric shock to your body? Honest to goodness study that was done. Unbelievable, the results. And here are the results. One fourth of women chose electric shock and two thirds of men would rather administer electric shock to their bodies than to be still with their thoughts. How important is this to us? How much do we resist it passively and actively? You'll never be able to choose rightly unless you're still long enough to know what the choice actually is. And so Joshua stood before them and he said, all right, here we are. We're at Shechem. What's it gonna be? What are you gonna choose? Who are you gonna become? As for me and my house, the choice is clear. It's important for us to remember that God first chose us. God first chose us. God first chose you so that you might actually have a choice, a real choice. God first chose you. You know why? So that you might choose the way, the truth, and the life, which is Jesus. God first chose you so that you might see yourself through his eyes, so you might see others, so you might see the world through God's eyes. God first chose you so that you might, in the words of Charles Wesley, in the famous hymn he wrote, get lost in wonder, love, and praise. Today we come to the table.